Welcome everyone to this special webinar. The first scientific evidence showing how tuberculosis impacts lives of people living with HIV came in 1983. I repeat, 1983, almost 34 years back. When out of 20 among the first group of people living with HIV in the world, 12 developed tuberculosis. TB is preventable and curable, but the ground reality is that it continues to be the biggest killer among people living with HIV. TB is also the biggest infectious disease killer in the world, regardless of the HIV status of the person. This is unacceptable. I remember in an interview given to CNS in 2009 in Rio de Janeiro at the third Stop TB Partners Forum, Michelle Sidby of UNAIDS had said, when a bacteria and a virus can work so well together, why can't we? Sadly, his words ring true even today. Let us hope governments and all of us united are able to deliver on the promise to end TB as well as HIV AIDS by 2030 as envisaged in the Sustainable Development Goals. And yes, when the HIV virus and TB bacteria can work together, why cannot we join forces to upstage them? That, my dear friends, is the moot question. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ram Suru, who is a widely acclaimed international award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa, with over 40 years of rich experience in journalism. He was the senior producer at South African Broadcasting Corporation, or SABC. Over to you, Ashok. Thank you, Madam G. That was our mock, uh, that was our senior managing editor, editor CNS. Warm greetings from Durban, South Africa, a country which has seen heart-wrenching impact of HIV as well as TB and drug-resistant forms of TB. But South Africa has also seen positive examples of human res resilience and courage in fighting AIDS and TB both. In lead up to World AIDS Day 2017, it is important to review that despite strong scientific evidence-backed policies and programs, we are still failing to avert every TB-related death among people living with HIV. TB continues to be the lead killer of PLHIV. According to the latest World Health Organization Global Tuberculosis Report 2017, 374,000 TB-related deaths were among PL HIV in 2016. Of the almost half a million reported cases of HIV associated TB, 15% were not on antiretroviral therapy as recommended by WHO. TB preventive treatment is expanding among PL HIV, but most people eligible for TB preventative treatment are not accessing it. In 2016, an estimated 10.4 million people fell ill with TB in 2016. 10% were PLHIV. Out of these, 74 were in Africa. According to the World Health Organization, the risk of developing TB is estimated to be between 16 to 27 times greater in PLHIV than among those without HIV infection. Let us know more about our distinguished panel of experts who will give us a better insight of the issues affecting the population. Dr. Linda Gail Becker, President of International AIDS Society and Professor of Medicine and Deputy Director, President to the HRV Center, Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, Chief Operating Officer Desmond Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation. Dr. Ishwar Gilara, President of AIDS Society of India, ASI, one of the first doctors 
who began HIV care when first case got diagnosed in 1986 in India, and founder, leader of People's Health Organization, WHO, and a die-hard AIDS campaigner. And Nomampondo Barnabas, a TB survivor, and person living with HIV and civil society leaders and officer, International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, the Union. Before we listen to our first panelist shortly, let me request you all to keep sending us your question either by using the chat function or raising the virtual hand of the webinar too. Keep sending the questions while panelists present. It's now over to Dr. Linda Gale Becker, President of International AIDS Society and Professor of Medicine and Deputy Director, Desmond Tutu HIV Center, Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine, University of Cape Town, South Africa, Chief Operating Officer, Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation. It's over to you, Doctor. Hi everyone. Sorry, I'm just checking that everyone can see my screen. No, we can't see it now. Can't see screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I think we might have lost the screen somehow. Uh, so I'll ask you, Shoba, to 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 move the slide on for me. Is that okay? Uh, yes, I think we'll move the slides for you. Very good. Yes. Okay, so hello everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with all of you. Um, in our first screen, you'll see that I've described this as TB control in a sea of TBHIV. And I'd like to explore both upstream and downstream interventions in the next seven to eight minutes. So I do need to move quite quickly. On the second screen, uh, second slide, I uh, really just uh, won't spend a lot of time because I think both. Um, introductions have already described just how much tuberculosis there still is in the world and how much of it is linked to HIV. Um, and, and I think it's important to note that 56% of, of the world's tuberculosis currently uh, resides in five countries. Um, and we should not also forget about multi-drug resistant TB of which there were about 500,000 cases reported in 2016. The next slide, um, slide three, reminds you that we have some very clear targets and these first targets are our HIV targets. By 2020 we hope to have everybody uh, in a 90% of the world's population tested for HIV, 90% of those who are positive on ARVs, and 90% of those virally suppressed. Um, and those are ambitious targets. Moving to the next slide, you will see how in fact we are doing according to UNAIDS in 2016. Uh, definitely in the part of the world uh, where TB is very prevalent and that I'm re representing today, you can see we've still got some way to go in getting to our 90-90-90 HIV uh, target. So that's again more for your information. Slide 5 um, just reminds you that we have similarly TB targets to reach. And as Shoba was saying, there are the SDG targets by 2030. And then there are the NTB targets by 2035. And you can see again, uh, those are ambitious. And unless we all get very organized, we are not going to meet those targets. The next slide uh, gives you a little more detail about the NTB strategy. 
Uh, and I think it's very important that you note that the deadline there again is 2025 for these global priority indicators. So that really I give you as background uh, to what the world is hoping to achieve. In slide seven, um, I show you how we're doing in terms of tuberculosis worldwide to date. And again, this comes from the WHO Global Tuberculosis Report. Um, and you've already heard that 10.4 million people fell ill with HIV in 2015, um, and almost 2 million people died. And you can see where the high multi-drug resistant TB countries are, um, and where the majority of those cases currently reside. I do want to point out, if you could just uh, hit the next four buttons, that um, in the first world, you really do experience individualized epidemics. So in other words, small pockets of outbreaks with low force of infection. When you move to these high red areas, the force of infection is 5 to 10%. And you are much more in the in the setting of a generalized TB epidemic. Um, so moving to slide eight, I really just want to remind you of the natural history of TB, where an individual goes from a susceptible point to being infected, which we call latent uh, disease, uh, where people may be infected with HIV uh, with TB. And then if they progress to active disease, uh, which a small proportion of people do, then uh, we describe them as having active tuberculosis requiring treatment. So just so you know that as background. In slide nine, um, I'm merely pointing out that not everybody who gets infected goes on to disease. And as you can see, it's about a one in 10 in a lifetime who go on to get TB that requires treatment or TB disease. Turning now to, to Cape Town, where I thought it might be very interesting for the leaders and uh, for the listeners to know that we report more tuberculosis in a single city in a year than the whole of the US, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, and large parts of Europe. So uh, in those places where there are generalized TB epidemics like Cape Town, uh, we really are still reporting a great deal of tuberculosis. We recently wrote a paper, and this is now in slide 11, uh, that I'm happy to share with the listeners on the, on the uh, webinar, uh, that compared 100 years of tuberculosis in New York with Cape Town. And you can see similar populations in New York in 1910, uh, and now Cape Town in 2010. And when you move to slide 12, you can see over the last 100 years what happened to the TB epidemic in blue in New York. So there you see the blue dots, uh, blue uh, columns of what happened to TB in New York. And you can see it went from a generalized epidemic to a localized epidemic to an individualized epidemic in slide 13. Now I would like to superimpose the Cape Townian epidemic in red. Um, and you can see that we have never left a generalized epidemic in Cape Town. We have always been in the grips of a generalized TB, TB epidemic. And not everybody realizes that. And this is the kind of picture you see in those five top countries um, uh, that are still in the grips of a TB epidemic. So what's different? Well, slide 15 describes that when you have a very high force of infection, such as we find in a place like TB, uh, Cape Town, then you have a much greater risk of TB disease occurring and this kind of uh, um, increased uh, cycle of infection that leads to much more TB. So I want to show you in slide 16 uh, the reality on the ground here in Cape Town. By the time a child enters school here in Cape Town, one in five will already have TB infection. By the time they sexually debut at age 15, 60% of them will have TB infection. And by the time they reach adulthood, they will um, almost all be TB infected. And you can imagine 
that then in the midst of an HIV epidemic, you really do see an incredible uh, increase in, in the rates of TBHIV. So in slide 17, I portray that in cartoon, that when you have HIV superimposed on a generalized TB epidemic, you really do have a critical situation. So that's where we're sitting today. And slide 18 describes very nicely, on the one hand, the, TB HIV, uh, the HIV negative uh, epidemic in Cape Town. You can see high rates in children dropping right off to adolescence and then this upswing in adolescence. Um, and then comparing that to the HIV positive uh, population in Cape Town, this enormous group of young adults becoming uh, TB diseased uh, because of their HIV um, in, in the age group 19 to 40 or so. So I wanted to think about how we think about um, TB in, in our primary healthcare settings. And you see um, TB clinics are a good place to pick up HIV and of course uh, people accessing HIV care and antiretroviral clinics, again, a very good place to interact uh, and screen for TB. So an important combination of integration that needs to be thought of. Um, and of course, if we don't do that, we see missed opportunities, inherent delays, and loss to follow up. So again, thinking this through in the primary health care setting is kind of a no-brainer, but I want you to think about how it almost uh, seems unnatural to put HIV and TB services right alongside each other in slide 20. So um, it really is, I think, something for us to think about integrating these services and certainly WHO has uh, instructed us that it's important we tackle the three I's, in, namely intensified case finding, INH prophylaxis, and infection control. Um, and there are lots of advantages to test all uh, TB suspects for HIV, to offer antiretrovirals without delay, and to streamline our services to provide both medications in, in differentiated service delivery, which reduces loss to follow up and enhances adherence. Slide 22, um, I think I do want to again make the point that we need to screen efficiently for tuberculosis amongst those who are living with HIV, diagnose drug resistance, um, offer more treatment options for MDR-TB, and these TB treatments need to be compatible with antiretroviral therapy, and they need to be well tolerated and safe. Uh, in slide number 23, review some data from uh, a review looking at integration of TB and HIV services in the interest of time. I won't go into that in a great deal of detail, but just to say that definitely the world is thinking about this now, and we're trying to think what the models of integration should look like, and there is, uh, you know, models out there that we can look at for best practice. And slide 24 really just uh, describes this particular model uh, that is worth uh, thinking about in more detail. Going back in slide 25 to our generalized epidemic here in Cape Town, I do want to just bring one other point home. Um, and what you can see to the right of the, of the graph in, in Cape Town is this huge upsurge of tuberculosis, which has been as a result of the HIV epidemic. But if you should take the HIV epidemic away, it's important to note we would still have a generalized TB epidemic. So that's a point I just really want to bring home, that if this is not all HIV driven. Um, HIV really just is a canary, if you like, pointing out that we have a severe TB epidemic still on our hands. Slide 26 makes the point that Cape Town has done every intervention on time uh, throughout this 100 years. So this is not because of poor services or because we have not been responsive to innovation. And you can see everything that has been done in Cape Town over 50 years. 
I would want to also show in slide 27 that whenever antibiotics against TB have been uh, discovered, they have been applied here in Cape Town. So again, making the point, this is not because we haven't had access to good chemotherapy. And you can see in slide 28, this has had an impact on our mortality here. But we continue to find ourselves in slide 29 in the midst of a generalized uh, epidemic. So what I would argue to all of the listeners is that this requires more than just treatment. This requires an upstream approach to think about how we interrupt TB transmission uh, in our communities and how do we think about that actually coming about. So when we think about diseased individuals, we definitely want to think test, seek, test, treat and cure. But to get population control, we might need to think about more structural um, interventions. So again here, this infection uh, um, model in slide 31 forcing us to think about upstream modalities. In slide 32, I want to remind you that TB transmission requires a, an infectious case, uh, people who are susceptible to TB, and shared air. So people have to be sharing air, for, which really talks about ventilation. And if we think about the, 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 the Wales-Riley um, equation, again, you want to think about the volume of shared air, the prevalence of TB cases, and the infectious quanta. Um, and so in similar vein, we want to think about reducing exposure, targeted case finding, and reducing infectiousness. Uh, so in slide 35, I do think it's important to think about shared air and where people are sharing air and where we can think about uh, intervening. So we've raised the question of classrooms and shared air and transport and shared air um, for, for other ways to uh, think about TB control in the future. So I'm going to wind up now it, with three uh, concluding slides. First of all, TB control. TB is still endemic and generalized in many parts of the world, and we need to tackle that. So primary prevention is something I want us to think about. Turn our attention further upstream to tackle transmission. We need to understand where TB is being transmitted, amongst whom and how, and that the transmission driver is often within the HIV-negative population. Those who are living with HIV merely become um, really, if you like, the susceptibles who become TBHIV infected, uh, but, but the HIV negative population drives this. Slide 37, we have to think about downstream interventions. More than 6 million cases, they need treatment, so we need earlier diagnosis, earlier chemical sterilization of those individuals, and sustained cure. We need to think about ways to enhance adherence, reduce TB drug resistance, and therefore realize the secondary prevention benefits. And lastly, slide 38, we need to think about innovation. Better understand aerobiology of TB, where and when to interrupt TB infection, improved massive uh, active case finding, think about new drugs, better vaccines, more options for multi-drug resistant TB, and ways to prevent lung damage and improve outcomes. My last slide, I just want to say, in terms of TB HIV, we have a localized epidemic within our generalized epidemic, which occurs in people living with HIV. It's important to reduce mortality in that group, so intensify case finding, offer IPT uh, or INH prophylactic therapy, reduce further contamination of susceptibles, uh, have pragmatic co-location of treatment, and uh, continue to do research on good models of, of integration. And I'll stop there and thank everyone uh, on my unit who continue to do this work and to the listeners. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Linda Gale Becker sharing your expert remarks. 
this was the perfect opportunity to listen from a lead expert from a country which had or which has the highest TB burden in the world. That was also the pharmacy of the world supplying 80 to 90 percent of medicine to fight AIDS and TB both. Well, let's get woman. Dr. Ishwar Gilada, President of AIDS Society of India, ASI, one of the first doctors who began HIV care when first case was diagnosed in 1986 in India and founder and leader of People's Health Organization, PHO. Welcome back, Dr. Gilada, to our webinar. Well, it's over to one of the leading experts. Dr. Ishwar Gilara. Yeah, uh, good evening and welcome to this webinar. I'm really glad that you have put me along with a very great personality, Linda Gelbecker. Uh, not only because she is president of the International Aid Society, but she is from South Africa. And we consider uh, India and South Africa as twin brother sisters. Uh, we have been together in the, both the fights with the tuberculosis or HIV and also in the uh, fight for the uh, freedom and we call uh, India, whatever India could help South Africa is a help for the second freedom struggle. Uh, I don't know why my screen is uh, blacked out, but uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Hello. Yes, yeah, okay. we can see uh, your screen also. We can see your screen. Uh, yeah, I can see my screen now. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, I have been telling for a long time that if you are looking at only HIV and people were saying initially that HIV is not that widespread, but we said that in HIV the major killer or major infection is tuberculosis. A person with HIV, if gets tuberculosis, will spread tuberculosis to others, may not spread HIV. HIV will be transmitted only through sex, but tuberculosis will be transmitted through air sharing. So uh, people were not bothered initially. And we needed to demonstrate a lot of uh, prevalence of tuberculosis in HIV patients, which went from 0.5% in 1988 to almost 20 to 30% uh, around the uh, 1990s, late 1990s. Uh, basically, if you look at tuberculosis bacilli and HIV virus, they are at South Pole and North Pole. They are totally different, diagonally opposite. They walk to the equator and they try to ruin the human being. So it has been a very good catch line that if they can combine, why we can't combine? And if you look at their morphology, if you look at their behaviors, they're totally different. HIV is 100% preventable, but 0% uh, 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 untreatable. Uh, not treatable, but it's not curable. Tuberculosis is exactly opposite. It's 0% preventable because it is uh, shared by uh, air sharing and uh, it is 100% curable, provided it is brought in time. And these kind of uh, infections coexist mainly because of, uh, tuberculosis has been a neglected disease. And if uh, you, we go by what has been sh shown by Linda, uh, Linda Gilbertner, that tuberculosis in uh, New York, New York is not New York per se, New York is representative of America and representative of all the developed world. So there you have seen tuberculosis has gone down to so now there is only individualized epidemic. That's the reason probably that there has been not much research in tuberculosis. In last several years, almost 30 to 40 years, you have seen only two new drugs coming in tuberculosis, melatonin and delamanib. But in HIV, if you see, because it has affected initially America, uh, also Europe, and therefore there has been a lot of research, and we see already 24 molecules uh, already in the market uh, for the treatment, and another 13 pipeline. So the entire world, particularly the developed countries in the uh, world, they were negligent about those infections, those diseases, which were more prevalent in developing countries. And tuberculosis is one of them. So India being number two in population, it is likely to be number one, number two, number three, number four in many of the health issues. But in tuberculosis, it is by far surpassing uh, China. And it is almost one, one third to one fourth of the tuberculosis burden. The major issues remain currently is MDR tuberculosis, XDR tuberculosis, MDR, XDR, HIV, and sometimes some people have, some patients have MDR, XDR, HIV, and MDR, XDR, uh, HIV, uh, tuberculosis together. Now, what has happened? 
India has uh, done a wonderful job of making uh, kind of a generic which are affordable and equitable uh, at almost 100% same by parallels at 1% of international cost. And that's the reason that currently almost 92% of the people in the world with HIV infection, they are taking Indian medicine. However, this kind of research has not been done in diagnostics. So we don't have CD4 tests, we don't have viral load which are generic or if they are generic then they are not equitable with the gold standard. So we need to do a lot of research in those fields. Fortunately, we have a very uh, good uh, direct prime minister who has put tuberculosis as top priority and he said that whatever you want, come to me, I will provide to see that tuberculosis is wiped out from this country and from the world. So with that kind of initiative, there is a, a rejuvenation in the program of tuberculosis and HIV. Now, the issue is tuberculosis has been a well established national program for many, many years. It has very good uh, infrastructure. HIV infrastructure has started only in the last 10, 15 years, 20 years. But if these two infrastructures and two, these two infections combine, then we can have a very powerful fight and powerful journey together. And we have been uh, uh, telling for a long time that you cannot have a vertical program for tuberculosis and HIV and hepatitis B and hepatitis C. You have to combine these kind of energies. Initially, it is very good to have a vertical program to get uh, required attention. But once the program is well established, then it is a duplication of efforts, duplication of manpower, duplication of offices, duplication of uh, kind of national program officers, state program officers. If you combine, then you can have at less cost, double the strength available. And that is being done to some extent where tuberculosis treatment is being offered at HIV treatment centers and HIV treatment centers also combined with the RNTCP program. But they need to be combined more and more efficiently and that is not happening. Now look at uh, some of the uh, issues where uh, uh, in tuberculosis we face problem with extra pulmonary tuberculosis. In HIV, almost 40 to 50 percent of the tuberculosis cases are extra pulmonary tuberculosis. And a lot of people do not have that clinical acumen to diagnose them. Even if you diagnose uh, clinically, you cannot uh, test them uh, with laboratory because a lot of tests are very difficult to do. For example, if there's somebody is having a serious tuberculosis, so doing a CSF examination, doing a lot of uh, kind of brain biopsy or some kind of tissue biopsy, it becomes very difficult and expensive. However, treatment of tuberculosis being cheaper, it is affordable. And currently, RNTCP program, that is our revised national TB control program, is providing entire treatment such a free of charge uh, for all over the country. And there are several outlets for the tuberculosis treatment. Now, with uh, newer drugs being made available, but only at the programs, national programs, it is becoming easier to some extent to uh, treat even the FDR and XDR tuberculosis, but that still remains the challenge. And the death rate has been very high in MDR and XDR tuberculosis. So we would like to combine our efforts also with the societies like International Aid Society, with the IAS and ASI, uh, the, the words are almost the same, but we are in India, we are a small organization of only one nation. International Aid Society is a very big or large organization. If we combine our efforts together, I think we can do a great job. And I'm really glad that Dr. Linda Gelbrecher being in South Africa, we being in India, we have a, a freedom struggle together for many years earlier. We can have uh, freedom from tuberculosis in HIV struggle also together. And uh, uh, I think by doing this, this kind of World AIDS Day or uh, International Human Rights Day, they will become more and more significant and important only if we combine the efforts. Otherwise, they will become only tokenism. You have only remember these decisions only on a particular day and forget about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was one of India's leading AIDS activists. Ishwar Gilada. Before we open the Q&A session, let us listen to the most important voice on the panel today. We believe voices of affected communities must be critical, must be central in responding to the epidemics. Nama Ampondo Barnabas, a TB survivor and person living with HIV, and civil society liaison officer, International Union against tuberculosis and lung disease, the union. It's over to you, Nama Ampondo.
And Noma, please unmute yourself. Okay. Yes, can we can hear you. Hear yes, yes, we can. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Yes. Um, uh, it's it's always a privilege for me to be part of this um this this webinar. It's not for the first time, and thank you so much to CNS for always thinking about me. And um, I've heard Professor Gail Baker talking about uh, ambitious um, figures. And what I'm trying to do is to really put reality into the whole um, webinar of today. Um, one of what I want to bring to the table is the important agency of TB service scientists to work closely with CSOs, to work all close in as partners in order to try and achieve those, those targets, uh, Professor Gil Baker. But what I really would like to share mainly on a personal perspective, which is sometimes also is common, which I've heard with, with my other fellows who have been impacted by both conditions, this we took in integration because we are seeing numbers of co infection. Um, the issue of pill burden is, is a huge challenge, uh, which sometimes can be as a result of loss to follow up, as, as Professor Baker mentioned earlier, pill bedding is, 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 is actually a quite a huge challenge. When I was infected with both HIV and TB, I had to take 13 tablets a day. It was my five TB tablets. By then, because that was again before we have a fixed dose of, of ARV combination, I had to take five ARVs. I had to take two antibiotics. I had to take, um, uh, uh, what's this? Please remind me, doctors, uh, paradoxic to, to prevent peripheral neuropathy. So if we can, as, as we move forward um, with this, uh, all the efforts that we are looking to trying to combat HIV, HIV and TB, we need to look at improved um, regimens that are tolerable with less um, side effects. And what I also would like to bring to this table is, is, is the issue of the countries which can easily adopt WHO and other universal guidelines. And yes, those policies guidelines will be translated into country policies, but then the challenge will be implementation, where you will find reasons like funding, um, we don't have funds, we still can and for me, really, the diseases are not in recession. So, always talking about funds, 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 it, it's not going to help at all. It, it, we, we need to, once we adopt those guidelines as countries, traffic policies, fine, but we need to make sure that they are implemented. And taking them to grassroots level, I, I, I like one of the slides that um, Professor Baker shared earlier, issues of PhD. Primary health care facility was this is the first level of, of, of where the community goes to when they seek health. So we need to translate most practices down to, 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 to PC, PC level. And what I also would like to, to bring to, and one of the challenges is, is, is that why it's important to go down to PC is we know that most of the population. Um, they are both socially and economically uh, challenged. So for them to get to those high level health facilities becomes a, a huge challenge for them. Uh, what else I would also like to talk about, one of the missing links, which also has come up from the civil society gatherings, was the issue of, of disabilities in TB. We talk now diabetes in TB um, which which is fine, but we have seen people losing their hip, they taking their MRT, uh, their MTR drugs. We have had people who have suffered TB of the spine and abdominal This one something that either research or um, whoever works in the field or to look into disabilities of, of TB. Even within the union, I have brought that up that we need to start discussing it and bringing to the table. 
um, which again would talk to the issue of improving the drugs, more especially around MDR drugs, which affects the hearing. And there's one lady from, I can't remember which country, who has lost her sight because of, um, of, of, of MDR drugs. She has attended two union conferences I've met with her, and she's always accompanied by her husband. So these are the things that we need to try and unpack as we move forward with all the targets that we are trying to raise forward. And we need to also not look at just the status of the figure. We must remember that we're talking about human beings here. Yeah? Um, yes, we, we need to try and reach so many, but let's not reach the target. Let's not trust the target, but let's put the human face and human perspective into the whole thing and try and address, come up with holistic approach to, to try and, 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 and combat the, the, the disease and reach our target. I think for now that will be it. Um, or maybe again, one is uh, will be mentioned importance of, 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 of including their voices. And this is one strength that I brought to the union because I've been involved in the HIV field as far back as 1997. And I've seen people with HIV turning the tide around. It was until people with HIV stood on the front line and said, this is what we want to see happening. And we need to do the same even with, with the TV society. Um, also, we voices and hear what the challenges are, what their issues are. So that, that, that's, that's good for now. Maybe then when questions come up, I'll respond. Thank you very much. That was uh, our final speaker. Final speaker, and now he's back. Uh, that brings us to the end of the experts' presentation. Now let us begin the open session. Participants, please keep sending your questions using chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. It's open session begins right now. Thank you, Ashok. We already have a lot of questions pouring in. Uh, the first question is for Dr. Linda Gail Becker uh, from Bangladesh. Zafar from Bangladesh wants to know. He says it is alarming to know such a large number of our population has latent TB infection and one in ten of them may develop active TB disease. This means huge new numbers of TB disease cases in high burden nations where latent TB rates are skyrocketing. How to avert this? How to avert latent TB not converting into active TB disease? Yeah, so th those are excellent questions, Shoba, and I went through that so quickly that I'm really impressed people <laughs> you know, got, got the gist of it, and, and I'm sure you'll make these slides available to people so that they can they can think about it afterwards, but I think two important points get raised from this. Uh, the first is absolutely right. Unless we start to have an impact on latent or infection, so the fact that so many people are being exposed to TB at a young age is, is the concept of the upstream intervention that we need to think about. How do we stop people getting infected in the first instance? And as you know, our only vaccine, uh, namely BCG, does not seem to protect against that. So, it, you know, one, in the long term, much like HIV, we need to think about a better vaccine. But failing that, uh, what are some of the structural interventions that we can do to prevent young people, because it's predominantly young people, who get infected at a young age and then become the sitting ducks, if you like, for active TB disease that may come on either immediately. So if you, we know that some people go immediately on to active disease. For others, they need to hit diabetes or get old or be nutritionally uh, compromised or, of course, have their CD4 count drop because of their HIV infection. And then those individuals go on to have active TB disease that requires treatment and importantly becomes a source of infection to other people again and so completing the cycle. So the first point that I think is raised by this listener is one, we need to intervene on that large pool 
of latently infected individuals. And then secondly, how do we prevent people going on from latent infection to TB disease? And surprisingly, there isn't a great deal of research about this or knowledge. I think there's increasing interest about those biomarkers. What helps us to figure out who's going to go on to TB disease. But that hasn't been known, despite the fact that we have known about MTB. Robert Koch discovered TB 130 years ago. So there are some real research gaps. And that brings another plea through this webinar that we have to have ongoing research, because there's a lot we don't know about tuberculosis. So, so, you know, I think this is another important area of research is how do we identify those who are most at risk for going on to TB disease and can we intervene more quickly in those individuals? Certainly HIV is a very obvious um, uh, risk factor for going on to TB disease and that's why making HIV doctors and clinicians more aware about TB and making TB people more aware about HIV is a, is a very obvious uh, intervention to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Becker. Uh, participants, please keep sending your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen which you see to ask yourself. Uh, we have a question from James Sandstrom. James, would you like to ask your question yourself? Would James like to ask the question himself? Oh, this question is for, for Dr. Becker. Um, yes. Uh, yes. In, in the early 1900s, New York City ran very large public education um, uh, programs uh, to educate the public about TB transmission. They did these at football games and theaters and all sorts of uh, approaches to educate the public. Would, would, such an, would a such approach or a media campaign work in Cape Town to help with the generalized epidemic? So James, you raise an excellent point, and again, thank you for picking up on what I rather ham-fistedly was hoping to do, which was to show that places like New York and indeed large parts of Europe brought the TB epidemic under control long before the discovery of streptomycin, which is our first anti-TB um, antibiotic. So, so I think the notion that we have, and I worry that we're falling into a similar um, sort of paradigm in HIV is that we can treat our way out of an epidemic. So all we have to do is throw more antibiotics at something and it will mysteriously and miraculously disappear. Well, clearly, New York brought their epidemic under control without any anti-TB therapy, but did a bunch of structural things. So you raise uh, public awareness as one option. But I know they also, you know, passed the Tenement Act. Every building had to have a TB window. Um, they separated those who had TB from those who did not. Now, that, that has some human rights implications, but certainly there, there are lessons that we can learn uh, from that, those 1900, uh, you know, uh, interventions. Rikers was rebuilt. Uh, big hostels were were taken apart so that you did not have large people exposed to potential infectious cases in unventilated venues. Um, and we have forgotten all those lessons and we haven't applied them in the third world and we've become somewhat infatuated with just treatment. And, and I think what I was hoping in a somewhat provocative way this afternoon was to raise the fact that we should not forget the structural, the behavioral, what, you know, Namapondo raised so beautifully, the human rights side, making sure that patients and clients are, are engaged in this process so that we come at this in a multi-pronged approach. Um, and so, you're, you know, I think increased awareness is always a cornerstone in our public health interventions. And so I would advocate, yes, that is very important. There was a time when there were TB, uh, there were window monitors in classrooms. So when carbon dioxide levels got to a certain level, you would open the windows and increase the ventilation. We are now, 
you know, increasingly educating young people in tiny, uh, crowded, poorly ventilated spaces. And this may well be feeding into our latent infection population. So I, I'm, I'm hoping this afternoon to have just raised in a provocative way some other ways of thinking about TB. Uh, thank you. Dr. Gilada, would you like to comment on that? We would like to listen to your views on this. Yeah, uh, basically uh, we need to have a really very big and uh, large campaign and not only for a particular day or particular occasion but for all around the year. However, in developing countries there are other issues which are more important. Survival issue is more important. Roti kapra makan means uh, only the eatable cloth, uh, inflation, they are more important than diseases. And therefore, that's the one of the reasons that people neglect, they don't go to doctors uh, easily, they don't go to doctors earlier. So, they are the diagnosis are late cases, and that, that's the reason that they suffer a lot. Sometimes they succumb to the infections or diseases. We, we need to really focus on these kind of issues, and I would like to appeal to Dr. Linda Gail Becker that we should not lose one single opportunity of fighting such infections for such diseases together. And uh, there is a saying in Hindi, Gaya ki gati ghayal jane aur na jane ko hai. Only wounded person know or understand the suffering of other wounded. And here in this case, India is one wounded and South Africa is another wounded. So we can understand each other's uh, feelings, each other's philosophy, each other's uh, limitations much better. So if we combine our forces, I think we can uh, overcome we cannot uh, uh, totally wipe out tuberculosis or HIV. They are uh, wishful thinking. We do make targets. They are going to remain. But we can work on a lot of issues and a lot of problems related to HIV and tuberculosis if we work together. Uh, thank you. Norma, what do you think? What worked in New York in the early 1900s? How can we replicate that model, particularly in the third world countries where TB is? such a big menace these days. As a community person, what, how can we replicate it? Um, I, I think, as I mentioned earlier, that I, I come from the HIV field. And we have learned a lot from the, um, the American strategies. And we have tried to apply them and we have seen them working. But again, some of them really, sometimes it's usually due to funding. Sometimes we're not able, because some, most of the strategies that we have learned from the community perspective is advocacy and advocating for our needs. But sometimes we always find very limited funders who are interested in funding advocacy. And we have seen, in terms of programs, we have seen in South Africa, and uh, uh, Professor, um, I'm so used to call her a LGBT. <laughs> we, 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 we have we received a lot of support from PEPFA, which really assisted South Africa. So I, I can say we, 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 we have learned and we can still learn and apply um, their, their strategies and efforts. Thank you. So, uh, Shobha, can I, can I just intervene yes, briefly, just, just to say to Namapunda that, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, I think I, I, I would hope that the lesson we would learn is not so much that we have to emulate New York per se, but I think the point I was trying to make, and I think you picked up on that, is, is that we've got to broaden our thinking beyond just treatment. And, and you come from an HIV world the same as I do. And, and I think the message also in HIV is let's not fixate on, on the treatment, although treatment is key. I showed you the 1990-90, we want to do that. But we mustn't do it at the exclusion of primary prevention and structural interventions as well as human rights. So that was the message that I was hoping would come through, um, you know, that we want to go beyond just pills. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay. We have a, uh, the next question is for Dr. Gilada. Yeah. Dr. Gilada also comes from the HIV world, where he began HIV care among first doctors in India. But then today, all the TB and HIV world, we are trying to bring them together. Uh, yeah. Dr. Gilada, there are two questions for you. The first one is yeah. uh, from uh, a journalist from Pakistan. Hello. 
uh, that sir you had the largest network of hiv specialist doctors in public and private sectors in india is rational treatment in private sector for tb posing a challenge in india uh you are seeking uh, we are talking about uh, tb plus treatment in private sector yes yeah uh, it has been challenged because what has happened is tb plus treatment was going on well in between uh, dots therapy came dots therapy was so confusing that you take medicine on uh, alternate days that is 3 out of 7 uh, days and then we realized that dots is failure it's a great failure in hiv patients with tuberculosis but otherwise also it was failure it was failure because of two reasons one is any day as a human tendency people in india we are not adherent uh, and they were anyway taking like dots even there was a regular therapy they were taking like dots and if you are giving them dots then they will if they skip one dose they are skipping for five days so suppose somebody is taking monday wednesday and friday not taking and taking next monday so after wednesday it is after five days he is taking the drug and that was a great failure so uh, private sector they could not um, cope up with the initial regular treatment then dots and again now it is regular treatment that was one reason secondly tuberculosis being as uh, uh, dr nita gelbeker very nicely put it it is uh, uh, spread through the uh, sharing air whereas hiv is uh, spread through the sharing the bed when you are expected to see that people will share the air lot of private sector people having lot of more crowded clinic wanted to avoid tuberculosis patients in their opinions and therefore uh, it was being treated only by tuberculosis specialist or chest physicians even today in a city of mumbai not single private hospital would like to attend uh, would like to admit uh, ndr tb case not a single there is not a single exception also so ultimately mdr cases hdr cases they will become a uh, point of only with the public sector and that was one reason that because it is uh, started transmitted through air why what would we like why to tell people particularly lay people that if a patient of tuberculosis open coughs uh, tuberculosis positive take even a first dose of treatment 80 to 90% of bacilli load goes down they become non transmittable by 80 to 90% and therefore we need to tell people that those people which are on treatment they are less dangerous than those people which are not even diagnosed and that message has to be given very loudly and clearly and somehow uh, private sector will be now roped in because rntcp has decided to uh, uh, shake hands with private sector they are providing uh, uh, not set or uh, 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 sector for diagnosis facilities for diagnosis Uh, facilities for treatment free of charge even at uh, kind of private doctors clinics so there are some of the organizations which have already started and they are networking with lot of private clinics and that is happening very nicely thank you uh, participants please keep sending your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand if you want to ask the question yourself uh, we have uh, dr gilada the other question for you is from rahul Okay. Who wants to know that you were right in saying that India is a pharmacy to the world when it comes to TB and HIV, but drug sto stockouts are a reality in India today. Please share how to resolve this, as Indian government's national health policy commits to end AIDS and TB too. How can we resolve this issue? You see, as an organization, Aid Society of India, we are partnering with NACO, National Aids Control Organization, as well as RNTCP. and we are telling that our members are at your service wherever you find our services can be utilized free of charge we are available there are problems and issues with drug stockouts then mainly because of some reasons like hiv treatment guidelines change quite frequently more frequently than the season in the country, uh, season in the year it was uh, 200 350 500 not tested treat however our political commitment or uh, health minister has given a statement that we will uh, go by test and treat strategy If you go by test and treat strategy, there are 400,000 or 500,000 more people to be added to the treatment. If we are not able to meet the challenges of one uh, million people on treatment by adding another half a million people, we will creating will be creating more problems. So first, we need to tone up the administration of drugs or drug stockouts issues, etc., or diagnostic issues or viral load testing, etc., for those one million people, and then we should keep on adding other people, which are anyway healthy. They are not. I'm not saying that we are against testing policy, but we should be slowly, slowly going towards that issue. 
but mainly going fast on the other issues where diagnostics are not properly in place. We are talking about 1990-90, the third 19 in India is so weak that we have out of 400 ART centers in the country, only at 10 or 12 places there is a viral load facility. 390 places there is no viral load facility. So if viral load testing is not there, how can you talk about third 90? So this third 90 is so weak in the absence of viral load. Now they are going to procure. So before you have to procure machines, uh, how, how, how the technicians in place, and then you increase your workload. By doing only increasing workload, there will be mismatch. And the other issue is only four states in the southern part of the country and two in the northeast, they have a high HIV load. Other places, they don't have much HIV load. So when the drugs are being distributed, they, sh they should take into account that these six states will require more drug supply. Other places will require less drug supply. That has to be also uh, properly plugged in. So some of the management issues are there, but probably they will be solved in uh, sooner than later. Okay, uh, that's uh, very positive and hopeful what you have said. Uh, we have a question from a uh, journalist from Indonesia for Noma. Uh, she says, Noma, you brought up a, uh, a very uh, pertinent point about the role which communities can play. Uh, so what uh, role can communities play so that governments roll out new treatments without delay? The shorter MDR-TB regimen of nine months is yet, yet to reach most people who are affected by MDR-TB. One in five MDR patients get treatment anyways, which is abysmally low. Please share insights on wh what, how can communities help in getting uh, the treatment regimens which are available, reaching the populations who need them most, quickly. Okay. There is not so much uh, of a timeline. Okay, for me quickly, the advocacy plays a huge role here by the society themselves making noise. Um, as I said, that I, I fled from the HIV field. Um, and secondly, in terms of uh, now that I'm with the union, I've seen a lot of uh, presentations for the community track where the communities play a huge role in, in finding um, a, what we call it activist finding. Because they are in the community, they are hands on. They see the, they see the, 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 the those who are infected by, by the disease. Key for me is helping to identify and, and, and refer those who need help. And secondly, advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. And my advocacy is three A's: is accessibility, availability, and affordability. It doesn't help to say we have a drug which is not affordable, which is not accessible, which is not available. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, with that, we come to the end of this webinar today. My heartfelt gratitude to all the panelists and participants for taking part in this webinar and enriching it with their valuable inputs. Special thanks to the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease for helping us host this webinar. The webinar recording along with the slide presentations will be made available to you, all of you as always. And lest we forget, World's AIDS Day, World AIDS Day is on the 1st of December. Let us renew our resolve to scale up TBHIV collaborative activities so that premature deaths due to TB among PLHIV that is, among people living with HIV, can be averted and lead the way to end AIDS and TB both by 2030. Goodbye and have a nice day. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everyone.